ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Entrepreneurship Drive. Today, I'm happy and excited to have uh, Joan Mwangi on set. Joan Mwangi is the doyen of, <laughs> of marketing, <laughs> the queen of marketing and the CEO of uh, PMS Group. Thank you, Joan, for honoring our in and inviting us to be here with you. Thank you very much. First of all, that's the first time I've had the word doyen used <laughs> in, in regards to any way, form or manner with, to me. So I'm in shock. <laughs> I found it hilarious. But anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. Should I look here or look at you? We can just uh, have a conversation okay, with you. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I think we can dive from the beginning. And uh, the beginning is uh, what decisions, uh, at what point did you make the decision of jumping into entrepreneurship and what was the motivation behind it? Okay, first and foremost, I was employed when I decided to get into entrepreneurship. I had started doing business as a side hustle, but it's very difficult to run a business and to grow it as a side hustle because your time is limited and also your effort and commitment cannot be because mm -hmm. your primary employer deserves what they're paying for and of course they demand a lot from you so i found it very hard to keep going on and so i had to jump out at some point when it was getting to a point where there was conflict between my employer and my side hustle and when i jumped out and started business it was because i realized that uh, the kind of wage level i was at with my employer uh, i was not going to move to where i wanted to be in the short term and I really was desperately in need of improving the standards of life that I was living at. So that is what that was my key motivator. And so I was already working as a brand manager in charge of certain categories across Africa. I had been well trained in marketing and communication. And so that was the first place I had to decide what will I do. And you know, once I was out, I had to decide is it in marketing? Or was I going to go into manufacturing because I had been working in a manufacturing firm so I also knew what I could do in manufacturing and in the end heads and tails ended up being communications and here I am. Oh wonderful. At that particular point what was the, I mean did you get inspiration from uh, as much as the, uh, I've gotten the element to do with improving the finances, did you have any other inspiration maybe from uh, family or uh, any other place that you were seeing that pushed you to this direction? I would say yes. I was brought up in an entrepreneurial family. From when we were young, our parents were always in business. Whether it's my mother running a kiosk where we are all there serving Giveri and Uji, or my father running businesses in River Road, we were always in an entrepreneurial space. I never grew up uh, understanding plain white collar job. My father was employed, but he was still running businesses. My mother was a housewife and homemaker as well as doing other biasharas. So for me, I grew up knowing that as a human being, you don't do just one thing, you do several things. So that's part of what drove me uh, from a background perspective. Uh, it was also a season when life was changing. Uh, when I look back and I say 25 years ago, it sounds like forever. But I can tell you at that time, one thing that had happened is that in Kenya, people had started actually uh, making entrepreneurship or what used to be called juakali a lot more formal and turning it into something that was admirable. Uh, people like uh, Rose Kimotho were emerging and succeeding and so we would look up to them and we would say oh my gosh what a wonderful success story I want to be like her. So role models were emerging in the entrepreneurial space both male and female and so those were also great motivations for us mm -hmm. and for me specifically yeah. Wow. Wonderful. There is the element of uh, books. I know you love reading. Yes, I do. Uh, at that particular point, uh, uh, did they play a part? Books, yes, very much. Um, I was always reading. I love mm -hmm. reading. I've been reading from when I was a child. And uh, one of the things I found is that when you read business books, you recognize that most people who have succeeded in business, most of the success well, would I say the number one success factor, the attribute, is that they just started. Just do it, you just, know, just because it. nobody starts knowing what the next step is going to be. You hope it's going to be a success. Of course, everybody plans for the best 
and then you know along the way it's an experiment it either works or it doesn't work but the critical bit was just to try just start just do it and so for me that was the one thing that pushed me and then I remember reading where you know where it said that 80% of success is just being there just turning up and then the next 15% was you doing anything, just try, just do something, you know? It's like shooting in the dark, you know? You just might hit something, you know? Then the last 5% is when you have your eyes on the goal, you focus and you shoot. So that was something that inspired me because I said, come watch me, I can at least achieve 95%. And in any form or language, 95% is a success. And it turned out to be correct because as you're trying to get to 95%, you're fine tuning your focus and therefore you get to the last five percent through trial and error if you don't do trial and error that last five percent is not achievable because they don't teach it in any phd you have to do it in the school of hard knocks live mm. <laughs> okay since we talked about books what are the what would you recommend for an entrepreneur to read like uh, your top read or two top reads oh my goodness i really can't remember i would rather don't have any really top reads i can say these are the ones because everybody is inspired differently yes. based on what drives you in your business because there are people who are chasing money they just want to make money yeah. there are people who are chasing impact you know and there are people who really just want not just impact but they want to sh see change that changes either the social cultural environment or the political environment and you can make money in so many different ways mm -hmm. and then there are those like me who all they wanted to do was to survive <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you know there's a book for each of those stages but what yes. i would say is that for anybody going into entrepreneurship the number one area of focus i would advise is for somebody to study two areas one is financial management and two it is systems and processes because without those two, your business cannot scale. It doesn't matter whether you're running a salon, a kiosk, selling skumawiki on the side of the road, yeah. knitting sweaters uh, on social media. It doesn't matter. If you don't have that plan in place, if you don't understand how to replicate what you're doing and to create systems that allow for your work to be scaled up by others and replicated, then you're stuck to just the 24 hours God has given each one of us. Yes. Mm. I still want to know your book, your I'll give you one book. I'll give you one book that stays with me, and it's not really a business book, mm. but it's a, it, it's on life skills, and this is um, the Forty Eight Laws of Power. And the reason I picked that specific book, Robert Green, Robert Green yes. Mm -hmm. The reason I picked that specific group, book is because when you read the book, it actually shows you how to carry yourself as a leader. For example, the fact that scarcity is one of the virtues of a leader because if you're too common too familiar too available people then do not see you as anything special you become just ordinary mm -hmm. and yet that's a very simple rule but yeah. you know you have to be told that otherwise you wouldn't know uh, another rule i really like in in the book is that whatever you do you must think about the person that you're addressing so that you meet their need in order for you to meet your own need because all of us are selfish so if i come to you and i want you for example to take a very beautiful video of me yes. then what i need to tell you is that you know what if you do a very beautiful video you're going to get a lot of following you're going to get this you're going to get that as opposed yeah. to me telling you i am going to look good <laughs> you know you know what i mean yes, so yes. it's to work that journey and and that balance strike that balance and i think that makes a very big difference in any line of business or entrepreneurship mm -hmm. so you can see that there's so many different i mean there are 48 yes, laws yes, yeah yes. Mm. ah very well i think now we can move now to the beginning how was it like in, for you in terms of putting the pieces together sure i was all alone i didn't have anything except my brain and I, I drive and desire to succeed. So I started off by setting up a little office and I took my plastic chair from the garden. I bought a laptop, I bought printers and started. And the most expensive capital expenditure yes, <laughs> in that yes. time was for me to buy a computer and a UPS, which at that time, a computer costed you about 200,000. You can imagine then how much money that was. And then a UPS would be something like 40,000. And then you had to pay Telcom Kenya to give you a line. It was, I mean, setting up a business was just so much harder than it is today. 
you had to buy a fax machine because that was the only way to yeah. that was how to have the fastest communication yeah. not the way we hit send right now you know yeah, and it's, it's, it's instantaneous <laughs> nowadays eh? so yeah. it was very different mm -hmm. it was a really different season and i'm really excited that today it is so much easier and more efficient for somebody to grow their business mm -hmm. so that's how i started it was very tough because by the time i'd set up my office paid the licenses, registration, stationery, etc. I had run out of capital. And so even as I was chasing my first job, I did not have cash flow. And for anybody in business, you know cash is king. Yes. The business environment at that time also did not have the myriad loan facilities that are there today. So we worked with what we had saved. We did not borrow. We could not afford to borrow and nobody would lend us anyway because you were not credit worthy. If anybody was going to get any money, and that was even later, it was people who really were salaried. And I know it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of mind boggling for young people to hear this, but it was also very hard as a woman to borrow money because you needed to be guaranteed either by your father or your brother or your husband. And, you know, it, it seems like forever ago, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and yet it's just about 25 years ago. That is so, in the mainstream financial yes, institution. Yes, mainstream financial institution. Mm -hmm. So really as a country and as a business environment, it has moved in leaps and bounds. It's much easier today than it was then. Although on the, also on the other, on the flip side, there's also a lot more competition and it's a global market. So you're not just competing with the people around you, you're competing with everybody in the world. Mm -hmm. mm. So when did the first client come in now? After how long did you get the first client? I think it took me about six to eight months to get my first client. Uh, initially, I went back to my former employer and they gave me some odd jobs, which would at least keep me going. Mm -hmm. But my first real client where I pitched and won a job was after six to eight months. And I cannot express the joy and excitement when I got my first check and it was for 680,000 shillings. Yes. And I didn't even want to bank it. I wanted to frame it and look at it forever. <laughs> I had never seen so much money. I had <laughs> never seen such a thing in my life. I was so excited. I couldn't sleep, you know? I kept looking at it. And even when I took it to the bank, I almost was afraid to give it to them. Like, you know, I need to hold on to it for safekeeping, you yes, know? Yes. So that was the beginning of uh, my journey. Okay. And once the money started coming, it's to reinvest back into the business and reinvest back and really uh, really live a life of frugality. Otherwise, I wasn't going to have working capital. And so the way I see today is that people get their first check, like let's say that one of six, 680,000. In today's parlance, it would probably be 68 million. So if you got a check of 68 million, imagine having the discipline to say that I'm going to plow it back in the business. I'm not buying myself a car, a shoe, nothing. I'm plowing it back into the business. And that's exactly what I did. Ah, two things from what you've said, Joan. We have uh, the eight months. How was that eight months feeling like? It was it, horrible. Was it like uh, you might even, uh, what, uh, am I making the right decision? Uh, questioning yourself at that particular point. How, how, how was it like? Then the next thing is to do with uh, the spending of that cash. Because uh, many upcoming entrepreneurs would uh, maybe blow that money because of that excitement you want now to upgrade life you want the best uh, maybe a new car or whatever uh, maybe new even clothes and those little things that uh, eat money up first uh, let me start by saying the eight months were really tough because you get to a point where you have nothing in your pocket you're struggling completely and i would say maybe the day when i really felt low was when it was my son's birthday and I couldn't even afford a queen cake. Nothing, nothing I couldn't afford. I didn't have enough money to do anything to celebrate. And I remember we were singing, thankfully small children are so innocent. I think we lit a candle on Ugali or something like that and just sang happy birthday. The yeah. child is happy, but I, I felt such a failure because had I stayed in corporate, that would not have been the case. I would have had money for a cake, even maybe for a party. So at such moments, you really question yourself. And you ask yourself, what am I going to do? Am I in the right place? Should I bounce back into employment? And as fate usually has it, when you're in your lowest moment is when opportunities arise to take you away from your goal. So while I was feeling very discouraged, I got an offer from one of the companies that was a competitor to my former employer. And they, gave, they were giving me like double the salary I had been earning before. It was really attractive. 
But I remember asking myself, have I suffered this much just to give up? You know, yes. and that's what helped me to stay the course. I didn't want to be a giver up to use that term. <laughs> yeah. And the second thing was that I also had had an inspiring conversation with an, an, an older entrepreneur who told me that, Joanne, when you get into business, I want you to know that you must not give up before you've done 18 months. I don't believe there was any magic to the 18 months, but believe you me, I held on to that statement and I wasn't going to give up until and unless 18 months were over. Because she told me that if you hang around for 18 months, you will know for sure you've given that business your best. That's one and a half years, you know? Yeah. You've given that business your best. So if it fails, you can never say that it was for lack of trying. You really tried. Then after that, dust your CV, go back to employment, and always tell people, you know, I started a business, but it failed. But I learned a lot from it. <laughs> so thankfully for me, the tide turned, yes. and I started making money, and I was able to stay in the business mm -hmm. and to grow the business. But it took great sacrifice. You know, to your second question of how, how I was able to manage the finances, etc. It was not easy because, I mean, like every other person, I wanted to wear nice clothes. I wanted to drive a nice car. I wanted my children to go to Splash. That was the place we used to go those days and go cutting yeah. and such. But I had to watch my money because I knew if I don't invest now, my tomorrow is going to be tough. But if I sacrifice now, my, tom my tomorrow is going to be smooth sailing. So I think it's really to look at whether you want instant gratification or whether you're investing into a future of satisfaction and financial freedom. So if you look into the future and you think how your old age will benefit from the sacrifices you make in youth, then you'll be able to do, to do the right things with your money that can reap rewards into the future. I don't by any means mean that, you know, you should suffer unnecessarily. I just think you should map out a financial plan where you know that you're paying yourself a basic salary, enough to live, but you're reinvesting in the business because that is the goose that lays the golden egg.